All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Now, this is the 218th Governance Service Call here at MakerDAO. My name is Aiden. I go by Pros11 online, and I'm one of our governance facilitators. I'm uh, happy to be walking us through the call today. Uh, I'm joined by a bunch of awesome people, those that contribute to Maker, uh, or, or if you're really interested in what we got going on here at our weekly call where we talk all things governance and this. I'll uh, hopefully give you a rundown of what's been going on in the Maker community uh, and talk some things out. Uh, before we get too deep into it, though, let's go into some ground rules. Yeah, pretty basic stuff, right? Uh, number one, like this is a recorded call, as you probably noted. Uh, so for the recording's sake, for, for Aaron and Joel, let's try not to talk over each other. Uh, you can use the raise hand function uh, if you wish to indicate that you've got something to say. I'm more than happy to call on you and give you the poll uh, when the current person is, is done finishing up their thought. Uh, obviously, we're comfortable with uh, all sorts of contributors, uh, anon and otherwise. We understand if it's a no-go for you, but uh, for those that can, we do appreciate turning those cameras on. It's always nice to see who's uh, joining us today. Uh, we have uh, chats as well as reactions. Um, if, likewise, if you don't feel comfortable coming on the mic, you can always drop a question or comment in chat. Uh, give me an app first and I'll know to, to read it. I'm sorry for the mic quality there, David. Uh, a few other things you could help us with. If you're going to speak, it's always nice to introduce yourself. Let me know uh, who you're coming from and what you got to say. And as always, it's an open call. So if you have questions, give me an ask. Yeah, basically, PDA. It won't get a long time. All right, we do have a bit of an agenda to get through. Um, yeah, apologize for the mic. Uh, looks like we have no initiative updates today, but we do have two discussions one on approval priority voting and one on MIP 91 from uh, here. Uh, before we get too deep into that, though, we'll give our standard report on what's going on in governance. Okay, let's click into it. Fairly quiet in on the vote front. Uh, no new polls came this week. We're expecting next week to be the last week for uh, this year's polls, uh, barring any unforeseen circumstances. Uh, we have been quite busy on the executive front, though. Uh, we did have that last one passed and executed, um, containing a number of items, compound D3M, uh, the stable coin uh, vault liquidations you might have noticed uh, this week. We have a new Oracle whitelist feed and some governance relay updates for StartNet in addition to NKR transfers. We're still on track for tomorrow's executive. Um, we are looking at a fairly large one, so do please review it in full when it goes on. The voting portal uh, includes things like Delegate Lock, uh, Gnosis Dow onboarding, Lock Dow onboarding, Ren BTC offboarding, and a whole host of Maker Open Market Committee recommendations. And I'll give you a brief for free from my mic. I'm going to turn it over to uh, our MIP editors to give an update what's going on in the land of Maker improvement proposals. Yep, thank you, Peyton, and hello, everyone. Pablo here with a new MIPS update. So we have no governance cycle in December, so let's move straight uh, onto the proposals in RFC. We have a whopping 22 active proposals posted under the RFC cell category in the forum. Uh, so in the interest of not boring you all to death, I won't go much further beyond roughly categorizing them and do like the biggest of descriptions. Um, so we have four top level MIPs, MIP 90, which onboards a real world asset pool to acquire USDC and then purchase a structured credit and money market funds. MIP 91, which introduces the concept of a defender contract against governance attack. So there's a minor correction there. Um, MIP 91 is not yearns, but MIP 92. Um, so MIP 92 onboards USDC from the PSM to yearn for yield. This is one of today's topics. And MIP93 proposes utilizing the HATS protocol. The HATS protocol allows for real-time on-chain verifiable roles, sorry, verifiable roles to be maintained throughout the maker of protocol. Um, next slide, please. So we also have proposals to remove, uh, remove MIP14, 
MIP14 establishes a generic mechanism for transferring DAI out of the protocol to amend the recognized delegate compensation MIP, to amend the interim facilitator onboarding process, to amend MIP63, that is the Maker Keeper Network uh, MIP, uh, to remove a specific component in MIP14 while keeping the rest uh, in contrast to the first uh, proposal I mentioned here, and also a proposal to remove two obsolete uh, domain framework MIPs. Next slide. We also have four special purpose funds. Uh, yes, the first one, MIP55 C3 SP11, will enter the weekly cycle this upcoming Monday as a short ratification poll, which will run for three days. Uh, it sets out to create a DeFi-focused language data set. Then we have a fund request to support uh, a strategic finances expanded mandate, one to develop a proof of performance for the Fidelian cluster, and one to create a self-insurance fund. Uh, moving on, um, as for coordinated framework proposals, that is those defining MIP 39, MIP 40, or MIP 41. We have coordinated affordance for collateral engineering services and for governance uh, communications. Um, there's also a number of placeholder proposals with no numbers assigned yet to afford uh, side stream auction services and immune fire security. Uh, we have a budget request by DevOps and a facilitator onboarding proposal for Nikolai Lolike to lead uh, collateral engineering services. And finally, we have two protocol die transfer requests. One of them, them aims, aims to sorry, uh, fund TechOps continuity through February until they can submit a new budget request in March. And the other aims to fund immune security from December 2022 to May 2023. We also have the onboarding of the chain and keeper network and a proposal to use DSS Kion to restart the burning of MKR. And I couldn't include this one in the slides because it just got posted, but we also have a declaration of intent to develop a comprehensive on-chain monitoring solution for real-world asset vaults. Uh, this uh, proposal will be eligible to enter the February governance cycle at the earliest. <laughs> and that's all from me. Thank you very much. Awesome, I appreciate it, Pablo. That should take us to our forum updates. Hello everyone, hope uh, everyone's doing great and welcome to the forum recap. I'll be covering the week of December 1st to the 7th and uh, it's been pretty busy on the forums. We have uh, at least one announcement. We also have a handful of discussions alongside a bunch of proposals and we have a uh, risk assessment by CES on GUSD. But without further ado, let me get into our announcement. Uh, with unfortunate news for me to say that Kat has stepped down from the Ambassadors program uh, over two months ago. She has done a great job, though, at building the team and helping the Latin American community. Uh, she did a lot of translations, a lot of posts, and, and kept the information up to date for that community. However, Sebex announced that he has taken her place in the meantime and communicates to all the delegates and mandated actors on changes made to the ownership of the multi-sig wallet, with Sebex now being the owner. And now, uh, moving on to discussions and proposals, uh, we'll start off with some endgame stuff. And last week, we saw some changes in endgame, specifically uh, updates to tokenomics and scope frameworks. And uh, First up, I do want to mention that decision is now up on whether to rename MetaDAOs to SubDAOs. In parallel, we may see several more improvements to the endgame language. The objective is to make endgame vision a uh, more clear and as communicative as possible for the entire community. So uh, feel free to submit your input on language improvements. You know, what sounds better and uh, what provides more clarity when you hear it. Um, additionally, Rune posted the final endgame tokenomics, which includes a tokenomics breakdown along with sub-DAO tokenomic mechanisms. So check that out. Uh, more information in the forum recap post. And uh, also early last week, Rune posted the very first work in progress scope framework, which is up for community revision and feedback. 
And uh, of course, Long for Wisdom responded with some of his thoughts regarding formatting and language to help improve on this scope's uh, clarity, syntax, indentation, and more things. Um, this draft uh, was a main topic during November 30th's DVC call. So if you're interested in a more unfiltered version of how this call all came together, check out the video. Uh, it's up and available on uh, the MakerDAO YouTube channel. And now moving into the offboardings section really quickly, uh, since MIPS are heavily covered by GovAlpha, I just want to mention the following core unit offboardings for the sake of spreading awareness. Uh, we have uh, Sidestream Auction Services, Immunify Security, and ourselves, Governance Communications Core Units, all uh, formally submitted MIP 39C3 Core Unit Offboardings uh, are now up on the forum. If you want to check each out, uh, links to each submission are available in the forum recap post. Uh, next, we also have some more details and proposals put up for our sub DAOs particularly the protector DAOs, which currently consist of Viridian and Spring Clusters. Uh, Alan Peterson submitted a thorough breakdown for protector DAO operating systems, implementation, and also a real-world asset exposure strategy plan. So pretty cool. Uh, alongside, um, the Viridian cluster requests a, uh, an SPF of 500,000 die to fund the due diligence, uh, completion, and ongoing management and monitoring of uh, MIP-65, uh, MIP-81, and MIP-88, as well as any uh, MIPs that will be submitted within the next six months where Monetalis would act as the arranger for them. Now, I'll end the forum recap here just to save everyone some time. Uh, of course, there's still more posts I haven't covered in this video, including the risk assessment uh, and payment, uh, risk and payment assessment on GUSD institutional rewards by CES. But if you're interested, check out the forum recap post. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, thanks for watching and happy forum posting. Take care. I know. I appreciate the update, Artem. As I said at the top of the show, uh, I don't believe we have any initiative updates today. So we could probably go we do. We do. And our next step at the top of the show. Yeah, so uh, we have an initiative update for the November financials, and I'm going to hand it off to uh, Strategic Finance. I believe uh, either Adrian or Mark are here to share. And uh, would you guys like the, sh the screen share? Uh, would you mind opening the... The slides I don't mind flicking through. We'll try and be brief. Um, yeah, shoot the link. I'll I'll open them. Happy to do yeah. it. Yeah, one sec. As always, these reports are available on the. Up, up, up. On the Google Drive link. Haha. <laughs> Okay. You're going to have to give me some access, bro. Useful to know. I need to make this public. Okay. Let's give it one more shot. Hey, awesome. And uh, I guess I could just go like this. Yep. Uh, you can skip to the executive summary. So next slide. I invite people to read the legal disclaimer on their own time. Um, the executive summary that we're... So in this month's report, we wanted to go into a little bit more detail on the RWA vaults, uh, mostly because they represent such a substantial part of uh, revenue from Mikadal, a bit of chain for the most part. And... We also have a few pages to talk about the impact of recent budget changes, um, the impact potentially of the, of the DSR, and to talk about an overall assets framework um, towards the end of the page. And just want to call out also some minor restatements in relation to an overstatement of liquidation income that we had in prior months that we've now corrected in as of this uh, report, but we've left the error in the previous reports to, to try and avoid changing history. 
Then uh, another important change is that we're removing the operating reserves from the broader DAO equity. So this was never part of the surplus buffer, but we're taking a more conservative point of view that going back funds from core units is very difficult and fraught with risk. So it should essentially be marked to zero. We could calculate it sort of back of the envelope when taking into account um, when, when trying to build up to a sort of operating runway, but it doesn't feature in our balance sheet equity any, any, any longer. Um, okay, so next page. So the monthly results are in line with the past few months with an ongoing flattening of net interest income revenues. Um, next slide. For the past few months, it's been reasonably compressed with substantial amounts of liquidation income towards the middle of the year, but no longer as the prices have mostly trended sideways for the past few months. You can dive into the, the decomposition of this in the next slide, where the one thing to note is the uptick in RWA debt issued as the PSM rebalances essentially to uh, move allocation from the PSM to RWAs, largely through MIP65. In the next slide, the lending business continues to decline quite substantially since its highs last year, about one year ago. And nevertheless, in the next slide, we see that although there is a sharp drawdown on total die outstanding, particularly when measured from the peak in February 2022, it's still holding at a reasonable sort of $5 billion in die at the moment with a zero or one bit TSR uh, turned on until now. So it'll be something that we'll track going forward in our where is die dashboards. And then here, I invite you to flick past this page. The link to this report is in the chat. Um, if anyone wants to go into more detail, click through next page. Here we outline there, there are hand, small changes here, largely net protocol income after token dilution, where we previously reported just on an operating basis in DAI terms. And then on the next page is the first one where maybe we wanted to have a bit more discussion, which is a table that shows the past, so core units. Left to right, we show core units, the annualized budgets, the actual spend based on the past four months, sort of times uh, times three, the difference relative to both. So the consistent story here is that most core units have underspent their requested budgets by a considerable amount. Then we show the new budget requests that are live in the in the proposal stage at the moment. We measure them relative to their actual spending. And then we show some of the actual spending plus the effect of what it would look like if the new budgets were approved and spent. And then we have a final column with uh, where we take out the, the budgets that were rejected in November and not resubmitted. So here, the overall story is that there's sort of 5 to 7% reduction in actual run rate operating expenses. And the flip side is that there's maybe 20 to 30 million in new annualized revenue, largely through sort of RWA vaults, MIP65, GUSD, whose first payment should be due soon, block tower, and so forth. I'll, I'll double click on, on GovComs, but strategic finance had a similar issue because we backloaded the spend towards the end of the budget period. So it looks like we're spending more than we have where in reality, it's like we underspent at the beginning and then overspent towards the end because we're only taking the last four months. But we will double click with you uh, on the actuals for sure. David. Um, if there are no comments here, just wanted to go down on the next few slides. where we talk about the summary of the asset framework in place uh, when thinking about the RWA's place in the maker protocol. And here the theory is that whatever maker stablecoin 
is pe is pegged to should be reflected in an appropriate balance sheet allocation, simply just to provide a better product to die holders. Running the protocol at a positive net interest margin can help grow the surplus buffer and, and shield against risks, and also help accumulate proprietary balances of decentralized assets to defend DAI's resilience in line with recent MIPS that have been approved by token holders. So in net, as DAI is currently tracking the dollar, it should be exposed to dollar-specific collateral. And in doing so, it must always prioritize redemptions for the underlying collateral. So we invite token holders to prioritize more liquid allocations over less liquid allocations, but for the same amount of liquidity, more yield is better than less yield. In the next slide, we show an illustrative asset framework, sort of how, and we're pinpointing specific vaults to where we see those, those vaults fall into place. And here, the way that we're thinking about RWA and PSM is splitting them on the RW on the pure sort of RWA side, we're talking about notably sort of private credit, whether it's off-chain or tokenized in part, like hybrid or off-chain vaults, such as HVB or some of the centrifuge vaults. And we make a distinction between those and the PSM, although there the PSM can contain some RWA elements in the fiat-backed stablecoin vaults, such as USDC and GUSD or, or sort of MIP65. MIP65, although RWA. We, we are considering it public credit just given its maturity profile and its liquidity and essentially its, its uh, utility as a treasury. So Kurt Barry asked treasury on the slide twice. Yes, because we're the ENS tokens are part of Maker's assets on the balance sheet and they're also part of its equity. So you know, if we wanted to do it nicely for everything, we would show on both sides, but it's this is kind of like a schematic representation of the balance sheet. Then the surplus buffer is in fact on the asset side. It's just the amount that the assets are beyond the size of the liabilities. We used to have a diagram in this report that showed this uh, distinction quite nicely. Uh, we might bring it back. And then in the next slide, we're summarizing some of the asset allocation myths and initiatives and trying to organize them along, along this framework of sort of yield and liquidity. Uh, notable changes here are dropping some of the MIPS that were rejected recently. Uh, we're pulling in some MIPS that were proposed recently, like MIP 92, and we're showing the update of the MIP 81 um, proposal that was updated in the post by Coinbase to 2.36 as of, uh, I think, January. And I think there's more in the report. I invite people to take a look and pose any questions in the thread so that other people can benefit from the from the discussion. And I think at this point, maybe to go back to some of the recent budget changes, I think there were some questions regarding the spending. So working backwards, how are we looking cash burn to revenues? So if you look at the I'd say a realistic picture of the cash burn is maybe the column somewhere between actual run rate plus new budgets and without November rejections. So it's 30 to 35 million a year annualized. Um, obviously, from purely crypto collateral, that's well overspent. However, we are deriving a substantial portion of interest income or accruing a substantial portion of interest income off chain through the RWA pulse. On the safety of deploying from the USDC PSM, I don't, so Seb is the expert on this, not me. I know that he looked at the, the maturity profile of circulating DAI to come up with a number. If I remember correctly, it was something like 20 to 30% is, should be kept on the PSM as such, even if it's yielding nothing in order to make sure that we can match redemptions. But given that DAI has a longer than, it has a, counterintuitively long maturity. A lot of it just circulates for longer than a year. 
uh, we can afford to invest up to we can afford to invest the PSM as long as 20 to 30% stays in the purely liquid form to meet redemptions. Um, Paper Imperium, uh, if you're referring to the numbers of the recent budget changes, we'll post the link to the, to the spreadsheet so that you can see it. We're basically just looking at on-chain polls. So it's not necessarily accrued expenses or reported. It'll tie to, to what the wallets have, have said. Although in the case of GovComs, we'll do a double click and we'll make sure it's updated. Okay. Any other I, uh... questions? Once in a while, I go that encouragement for the questions on the floor. Yeah, there's more in the report. We go into a bit more details. There's links to June dashboards that report some of these off chain. Um, so MIP65, there's Seth has a June dashboard for showing how much is invested and how much is accrued. Uh, but we're not bringing this in yet. We're still trying to figure out the, the best and most conservative way of reporting this in our, in our monthly pages. Cool. With that, I'm going to leave the floor to others. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on and present for us again. Thanks. And I'll connect with David to, to make sure that we represent the expenses correctly. All right. Excellent. Now we're finally under our discussion of the segment. But sorry, we jumped into the game earlier. Uh, I believe we are starting with a discussion on prioritization uh, methodology. Um, awesome. And I think we have long to wait here to say a few words um, about foreign policy just now. Yeah, Are you with us long? Helps if I unmute myself. Hi guys, hey. how's everyone doing? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just saying, um, yeah, this is this a couple of slides of this, so maybe not entirely a discussion. But, uh, hopefully you'll bear with, bear with me. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of discussing a post I made recently, um, discussing a potential like um, system uh, of governance to use or a voting system to use uh, in MakerDAO to help improve uh, governance outcomes. So yeah, next slide. Cool. So in the past, and I guess up to now, um, I feel like it's fair to say we've kind of struggled with prioritization across the DAO. Hoping most people will, will agree. Well, not hope, well, I think it's evident to most people that that's true. Um, we've mostly used binary votes on individual proposals, right? So we've had like yes to no, yes, no votes on things as and when they've come up. Um, we've previously used approval voting on the forum as part of signal requests. Um, that is approval voting in case you weren't aware. Um, at least when we have multiple votes, um, that's what we used to. Uh, and I believe we may have used it on chain a couple of times now, not 100% sure. But um, we've definitely used uh, IRV, um, instant runoff voting, also known as ranked choice voting uh, for a few polls uh, on chain. So these are kind of the things we've done thus far um, with, with voting. Uh, so next slide. Yeah, so. First thing to say is like none of these were exactly like bad choices, right? Like these were kind of the obvious first places to start when we were thinking about doing governance, um, especially uh, sort of in the situation we were when we sort of started that like the DAO sort of started up. Um, but the important thing is none of those are kind of really ideal for prioritizing items, right? Like if you have a list of things that you want to do, um, none of those voting systems are really great for like ranking the list in order of preference from like multiple um like multiple inputs um ivy is kind of looks like it is a little bit um but it's 
not amazing. It's kind of better at, at selecting like a single option or a single winner from a ranked list, list of ranked preferences. And um, the reason for this is it discards secondary preferences um, in the event that your primary preference is winning. Um, so it's like it takes information from the voters only in certain cases, which makes it less less good for this sometimes. Well, by some arguments. Um, an approval voting can be used for this as well, right? You can just sort of ask everyone, do you want this thing, yes or no? And then you can put the ones that the most people like at the top and sort of rank them like that. And that can be your priority list. Um, but that's sort of very low resolution, right? Like if you're voting um, and you have like five options and your only choice is to vote them all yes or no, um, you kind of lose a lot of like information there in terms of what the voter thinks is like more or less important, right? Or to the extent to which something is more or less important. So moving on, thank you. Yeah, so approval priority is a system that we uh, kind of just made up, um, which is a combination of approval and positional voting. Um, I'm not going to go into what positional voting is too deeply here. It's kind of written in the in the post and there's links to Wikipedia and all that sort of stuff. Um, it's essentially a system where each option you rank is assigned a score like by the voting system. So you provide a ranked list and then it assigns weights to those based on the positions they are in the ranking. Um, so the kind of key key things to, to sort of keep in mind about this are is we've sort of made it so it's let's see we've made it we've designed it so it's still a single input to multiple output right um, so it takes a single set of ranked inputs um, where you rank any number of options. This is kind of similar to how we've done IRV thus far so it shouldn't really be anything too surprising or different here. Um, and each poll outputs then um, how approved each option is. So it tells you what the answer is in terms of approval. So as if for all the options you've ranked, you'd ranked yes. And for the ones you didn't rank, you chose no. So it basically runs approval voting on your list of rank preferences. Um, and it also uses a positional system to kind of figure out how much of a priority each option is relative to the others. And that's kind of the other output. So the kind of key to this is it separates out two bits of information, um, namely like whether you want this thing, and then be like how much you want it relative to other things, which is kind of sounds similar, but are sort of importantly different. So moving on. Yeah, so this gives you the ability to do something like this, right? So you have, so you have to run this poll with a list of options. Um, people have put in their rank preferences, and you get an output with um, a list of how approved, like not a list, an answer as to how approved it is, or each option is and an answer for like how much of a priority each option is. And that lets you kind of interpret the results based on these two axes rather than on a single axis. Um, and the two axis information are, you know, again, do we want it? And is it important, right? So you have approval, do we want it? Priority is it important. Um, again, these abstractions not strictly speaking true, but close enough. Um, so you kind of, can kind of see if something is approved highly and is high priority, then there's maybe strong consensus for it. Should probably, someone should probably work on it. Um, going down to, you know, if something's high priority but low approval, that's kind of a danger sign because it shows that some people want it really badly and others uh, don't, um, which is kind of a recipe for, for a kind of division and contention. So that's kind of an, in, uh, an indication that someone, whether it be the delegates or, or Gavaf or whoever, um, you know, puts some work in to try and um, kind of come, kind of bring those two groups into some sort of compromise. Um, and then it also shows sort of thing. That, David? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, go ahead, David, if you have a question. Oh yeah, I, I, I was I was happy to wait for Long to finish his bit. Um, yeah, I guess like just practically speaking, uh, the way that this would work, I just want to make sure that I have it clear is that the options that are not approved are just not selected. So if you don't select them in your ranked list, it's counted as not approved, and then for the ones that are in your ranked list, they are all approved. Uh, but depending on how you rank them, they are uh, judged on their priority. So that's the priority weighting. And then the uh, chosen or not chosen is the approval uh, piece of information. That's correct, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. OK, yeah, cool. so it's, yeah, it's kind of a bit of a hack, right? You're sort of collecting two. I mean, you're collecting, you're splitting out the information you've been given into two separate like uh, metrics, essentially, um, which is a little dangerous if you actually sort of overdo it. But like, I think it's all right in this in this case. Um, cool, so moving on. 
cool. So coming to potential use cases, um, there's a number of things we could use this for in the DAO. Or is there kind of talk to prioritization in a very general sense? Um, at a sort of low level, this is kind of what I was talking about with prioritization, right? Um, if governance wanted to send like a quantifiable signal to a given core units, um, kind of easy examples are like protocol engineering or um, CES. You know, we want you to work on like this is the these are the options for engineering work you could be doing. Governance votes on them. Um, you can then see, you know, how important governance thinks they all are, like whether any are sort of highly approved but not very important, or whether some are like very important um, but very contentious. Um, and it kind of just gives a core unit more information or like more quantifiable information about what how governance feels about a set of possible like work items. Um, and the same sort of true for, for CAS with sort of collateral onboarding. Um, so that's kind of the level option. Um, potentially you could also use the system on a, a sort of like a higher level, right? So I know at one point people were sort of talking about how to set sort of goals and objectives um, for make a DAO. Um, potentially you could use this system for something like that. Um, you can kind of see this this example uh, mock-up from Ducks here. Uh, many thanks to Tiago for producing that and Dennis for approving it um, or improving the work. Um, so yeah, so this kind of gives you maybe an example of what like a summary page for these could look like. You know, it's kind of assumption here is that you ran a few, I think it was like you run, you know, polls every year or you run year-long polls or sort of quarterly polls um, to kind of determine goals and strategies. And this gives you kind of a summary of what governance believes the focuses should be for the DAO for the next year or for the next quarter, the focuses for the year and the strategies for the quarter. Um, and then coming to sort of end game, which is obviously kind of um, taken over a little bit. Um, I think this fits less well with end game because it wasn't really designed with end game in mind. Um, but I do think there's places in end game this could be used as well. Um, specifically, um, like work in scopes. Um, we need to be prioritized, or potentially not prioritized, it depends exactly how scopes work and, and councils end up operating. But um, potentially scopes could could include um, you know, prioritization information, right? Like we think this is the most important thing to do um, in this scope. And I think there's potential for it in like internal DVC governance as well. This is kind of another thing that we haven't seen too much of yet, because there's obviously only one DVC. Um, but in the future with multiple DVCs, they're going to kind of run into this issue of how DVCs themselves, like man like DVCs manage themselves, like in terms of membership, um, in terms of you know what they're going to support, what they're not going to support, um, like what they where they expend their efforts, um, and so in terms of sort of lobbying and politicking, um, and then potentially metadata governance as well, um, just because I think metadata are going to have maybe not initially, but are eventually going to run into many of the same problems that. Make a DAO did with prioritization and um, determining what exactly governance wants, you know, the core units or admin team or whatever to work on at any one time. Um, so yeah, I think that comes to the end. I don't know to the next one. Yeah, so that's uh, kind of an overview of, of kind of what's in the, the forum post. Um, if this sounds interesting to anyone, I suggest you go and read the forum post. Um, so I'll sort of. Yeah, if it's the questions, or maybe just to sort of say, um, I think the current plan is to sort of not pursue this any further, given that endgame is sort of, um, you know, sucked to the air out of the room a little. Um, so if people did want to see this proceeded with, or did want to see this implemented, um, we'd kind of need to see some sort of strong expression of support, I guess, from delegates and, and larger token holders. Um, but yeah, uh, any questions, feel free. Thanks for everyone's time. I'm going to be asking some calls for recent dog abuse, but questions, comments. So uh, we definitely have some time to spend on this. If anyone wants to chat about it. Yeah, go for it, Wendy. Yes, thank you. Um, I uh, mostly have a comment. Uh, I th I think this is uh, incredibly useful work that um, 
uh, will be very relevant for end game. I think in the areas that were mentioned. So for example, if um, uh, working within a scope where there is a particular budget available, um, this can be used to uh, to steer the priorities of the uh, the suppliers to that scope, whether it's MetaDAOs or endgame uh, or ecosystem actors. It, uh, the structure as it is defined high level uh, in the end game plan doesn't really solve for the uh, the prioritization problem. So a mechanism like this will uh, will still be needed. Um, I think what uh, what it requires is uh, a bit more around the edges. So for example, uh, how would the budget cap factor into this? And um, uh, when you when you support a certain or you, you're funding a certain roadmap, there's always the question of um, how do you want to prioritize, but also how fast do you want to go? Um, so there's a number of details to be figured out there. But um, yeah, we uh, within SES, we will be working on proposals for interfaces to, to turn this into tools. And um, we'll definitely be using this as, uh, as input to uh, yeah, to, to see where that fits. And again, I think this, uh, the prioritization problem still exists, whether it's in the end game structure or uh, outside of it. So um, we'll definitely be uh, be using this and, and reaching out once we get to the point where, um, yeah, we, we consider wireframes and things like that. Cool, yeah, I, I think it's sort of, I think it was mostly de not designed in isolation, but designed from like a kind of, so a very like theoretical point of view in terms of like what would be good to help prioritize stuff. Um, so yeah, I could definitely see it needing more work to fit into like actual real, real world use cases. One of the, the other challenges that I see is that um, prioritization in uh, in a vacuum, I, as we do the analysis more and more, I think that um, things won't be that, as simple as just prioritizing a list of options. Uh, very often you have to deal with, uh, for example, dependencies between the options. Uh, so maybe you need one component before you start working on the next one. Um, and this, this seems to be the case, uh, whether you do low level micromanagement where it's super obvious, but uh, even for high level things, uh, there are there are dependencies between the options often. And um, so I, I think that the, the algorithm uh, will need to take that into account. So maybe the outcome of the um, the outcome of a, of a poll that would be run in, in this uh, the fashion that is described here would run through another algorithm that would, for example, insert the uh, dependencies where needed so that we we're not basically voting for uh, for an execution order that isn't that isn't practical. Uh, so that that's that's another consideration, and um, yeah, that that doesn't uh, change the value of the work. It just uh, means that we again we need to plug it into a, a slightly bigger framework. Yeah, I think that could make sense. I think my sort of I mean I, I hadn't considered dependencies in detail, but my sort of naive input is like. Well, as long as we make it clear, like what each option entails, and we say that we can't have this one without this one, then hopefully voters would take that into account when voting. Uh, but I'm aware that in practice, that is not always the case. So perhaps you're right that we need some sort of uh, secondary system to, to sort that out. You do have a question in the chat. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, so Code Knight was asking um, how many CUs have indicated a desire for a system like this. Um, I kind of mentioned um, P and CES um, sort of while I was talking. I believe, so I don't want to sort of over overstate things, but we sort of approached them informally and sort of described uh, this sort of system and whether this would be useful. Um, and they indicated, maybe that's not true. I think they indicated they would find useful a better system for understanding what governance wants them to do and in what order. Um, to which this is kind of, well, in our mind, the answer, I guess. Um,
Do we have any delegates or MDR voters that um, are interested or have comments or questions on the system? I guess I could say something. Speaking as both an MKR holder and as a communications professional, I think uh, the biggest thing I was impressed with with this uh, uh, with this proposal and innovation and governance is the fact that it surfaces a, a way richer set of information. Um, so I, I think the fact that you could even read uh, like the dis divisiveness or you know the the level of consensus, um, I think is extremely good for uh, for communications in a decentralized org like ours. Um, so apart from even uh, the governance utility, I think uh, it has huge utility on the communications perspective to get everybody on the same page. Um, so yeah, I, I applaud this. This is, this is great from my perspective. Appreciate it, David. Do you have one more topic? We'll give this kind of a last call. If there are any more questions or topics we want to discuss, otherwise we'll move on. Can you yeah, hear me? Well, yeah, we could hear you, Corn. So uh, for this discussion topic, uh, we actually have the uh, the authors of the proposal here to give a brief overview before the Q and A session. So, uh, so Corn, yeah, take it away, man. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I am Corn, and I focus on partner integrations. And before I start my quick rundown of MIP ninety two, I just want to thank everybody for participating on the forum and asking all the tough questions and, you know, please keep them coming. They're really important to us and we don't want to leave any stone unturned at all. So I'm, I'm going to give a quick background on Yarn just for folks who are going to be maybe reviewing this recording after and don't know a lot about it. So Yarn was founded in 2020 and it's DeFi's top yield aggregator for risk adjusted returns. And Yearn is supported by around 30 full-time contributors around the world who coordinate to find the best safe opportunities to farm yield in DeFi. Yearn vaults are all on-chain, transparent, and have successfully scaled up to $6.4 billion TVL and back down to 400 million with no funds lost. And as we all know right now, this is a task not many in CFI have been able to accomplish without disaster. And of course, the secret here is safety, security, and um, risk management. So aside from the Yearn core products, Yearn contributors have built and contributed to the creation and development of products and services and industry standards like the audit firm, Y Academy, Coordinate, ApeWorks, Viper, Brownie, Disperse, Allow List, ERC4626, and more. Um, I do want to mention uh, that Y Academy's fellowship program this year educated 59 auditors. And this was their first year of their program. So that's uh, an incredible success for, for Yearn and Y Academy and for the entire DeFi industry as a whole. Um, Yearn contributors have also presented on risk management and strategy, strategy creation all over the world at ECC, East Denver, Dubai, Amsterdam, and at the Stanford Security Summit. So, um, should I, can you go to the next slide, please? There you go. Um, so our goals for this program are for it to be executed safely and slowly, to further validate the case for DeFi and risk off integrations, and to work alongside all the maker teams in a long-term partnership. You can go to the next one. Oh yeah, thank you. So of course, uh, what better time to prove this than right now with our current market conditions when traditional yields are historically high and DeFi yields are historically low? Um, of course, these conditions are not going to last forever. 
and everyone here on this call right now is here building today what we are going to be using tomorrow. So uh, later on, I'm gonna get into the menu of strategies available for YBUSDC today. And uh, I, I just wanna cover urine risk management first. So urine's risk management framework evaluates eight key metrics. And this model was adapted from how risks are managed in the aviation industry. We evaluate complexity, protocol safety, TVL impact, team knowledge, longevity, testing scores, code review, and third-party audit. So the complexity is how complex is it to fully enter and exit a strategy position. Protocol safety is the overall best practices of the protocol audits care procedures, time locks, that sort of thing. TVL impact is how much of the entire portfolio is impacted if a strategy were to fail. Team knowledge is the measurement of how many urine team members are in the know about a strategy and can react in an emergency 24 seven. Longevity is how long has a strategy been around. Testing scores are uh, how much testing has been done on this particular strategy. A code, code review is our, in, our own internal code review. And then third-party audits, we go and obviously examine all the third-party audits that have been done on the protocol, on the project, and on our own strategy too. So these scores can be seen in real time at yearn.watch slash risk. And uh, now that I've covered risk, I want to cover the vault for this MIP. So, we decided from the start to make a bespoke USDC vault just for Maker and completely separate from the production YV USDC vault that's been live for over a year now. And in this section, I, I think we did a bad job giving out the right information. We provided a, a whole menu of the current production YV USDC vault strategies. And based on the forum comments so far, I think this menu is oversharing. And these vaults are all of the current options. And in no way are we saying this is a recommendation of strategies that you should include because we don't think you should loop strategies with Maker, G, and E. We don't loop strategies. It's dangerous, and we're not going to be doing that. And with that strategy aside, and based on the overall TVL of the current strategy as an APR is in the table that you're looking at right now, we are confident that we can still provide low risk strategies that perform around 2% ATY, even in current market conditions. So why are we showing all the TVL there? We're doing it because this demonstrates that there's room for $100 million or more without crushing the yields. And of course, uh, in no way do we recommend doing a single $100 million deposit to do this safely. We are going to start really, really small. And it's going to take months to ramp up to $100 million. And this is a long-term engagement to work alongside the Yearn team and the Maker team to seek out the best strategies and the best composition that makes sense for you. And these are the ones that are available today, but tomorrow it could be different. And we're always working on new, building new strategies and we're always being approached by projects who want us to make vaults for them. And getting this relationship and these processes in place today means that when the market changes, we're prepared to benefit from that immediately. And there's gonna be a lot of work that has to be done up front and a lot of communication that has to be done up front, but we are in this for the long haul and uh, we just simply have to start doing this today. So let's talk about the fees. Um, this part is really simple. So Maker keeps 80% of the fees generated. Urine performance fee is 20%. There's no management fee at all. There's no withdrawal fee at all. And uh, this is a very simple way of doing things. And uh, lastly, before I open up to questions, I just want to cover vault controls. So the, the production YZUSDC vault today, 
and all of the other urine vaults are governed by the six of nine urine multi sig but that's not going to be the case for this maker vault. Uh, we propose that your vault is under the sole control of maker governance, and uh, we've outlined the four methods for changing a vault setting. And I haven't seen any comments in the forum about this in particular, so if there are any, please ask and we'll be happy to answer. So uh, thank you for going through all of that and thank you for having us here in this governance meeting again. And uh, yeah, any, any questions, we'll take them. Awesome, I really appreciate you all coming on to the call. Yeah, I guess I, I, I meant to field more questions, but uh, I was a bit distracted today. Um, so, but I did field a couple. Uh, so one was, uh, uh, I'll start with the second one actually, because I think it's more fundamental, but how long would this take to ship after it was ratified, after the vote would be ratified? Well, so, uh, this is a question guess... also, sorry, sorry. This is a question <laughs> mostly for like Maker as well. So it's not just on Ucorn. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it depends on what you define as shipping. I mean, we, we could start allocating a very small amount of money to a strategy um, and then ramp up from there. The, the, the process is not going to take like months to get from A to B, uh, but to ramp up fully, I, I do expect that process to take months. Yeah, so to just to, to step in for a corner a bit, if just the from a technical standpoint in terms of this vault being ready uh, for existing strategies, like we could do this tomorrow. Um, you know, if it's if it's existing strategies that you know Maker has looked into and feels comfortable with, and we can talk about that. Um, but from the implementation standpoint, you know, there's 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 no expectation of you know we're we're waiting to build something new for Maker. Um, these are all things that have, you know, already been in, in use for months, uh, if not more. Yeah, I think the question from the maker side would be, do we need to build anything specifically on our end to facilitate control of it? I mean, you could obviously do start out the like simplest way of just, you know, put something in a governance spell that deposit some USDC or whatever um, manually into this uh, urine vault. Um, but we might want some sort of like instant access module on the maker side that can, you know, adjust the allocation dynamically, you know, based on rules or based on like redemptions from the PSM to like maintain, a, you know, only up to a certain percentage of assets in it. And something like that, you know, could take longer. But if there was a desire to start sooner, you could always just do like the simple thing first and then do more complicated things later. Sure. Yeah. From from the urine side, you know, all any smart contract uh, would need would you know the ability to interact with the vault interface, um, which is just depositing and withdrawing. Um, so very very simple from the from the urine side. I know uh, Code Knight, one of our recognized delegates, had a question. Uh, if you want to hop on the mic, Code Knight. Sure. Um, I was just asking where this why the hundred million dollars for the uh vault cap i feel like it just seems like with the yield so low you know if we want to just do the technical work to get ready we could set the cap to you know zero or a million dollars and then increase it if the market environment changes yeah so the reason i did that actually is relative i saw the ousd proposal for 100 million dollars and i wanted to pick a number that allowed all of us to focus on the technology and not the number and that's why i picked it okay well that you might have noticed that proposal got shot down so <laughs> i did notice that We can start smaller. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll voice yes. Nadia's question. Um, uh, so what are risk core units thoughts about this? I remember in the past, they were reluctant to invest in DeFi. 
Corn, if you if you were going to respond to the prior question, feel feel free to do that. I'm sorry. What was the question again? Uh, the question was actually towards the risk core unit, and uh, oh, basically it. asking our our risk team uh, what what their thoughts on this proposal are. And I'm actually checking the participant list to see if we have anybody here. Yeah, I don't think anybody's here today, unfortunately. But yeah, that's that'll that'll be an open question for them. Yeah, sure. I think a little bit of on it from like a protocol engineering perspective on the risk, if that's useful. Um, you know, we're we're obviously not the risk team itself, um, but you know, we think a lot about the smart contract um, side of risk and. Obviously, with any integration you do like this, um, you're, you're exposing yourself to all the underlying risk of, you know, not only the urine smart contracts themselves, um, but whatever they're interfacing with to generate that yield. Um, that is, you know, a massive parfait of risk that is, you know, probably not feasible for us as a team to go off and audit all the layers of that. Um, now, you know, that said, I think, you know, urine has excellent security and safety practices um, from, from what I've seen. And, you know, if I were going to pick a protocol to put, uh, you know, money in for yield um, or, or yield aggregator, urine would be the one, you know, I'd probably pick. Um, you know, that said, you know, you probably want to limit your exposure um, pretty carefully, um, especially first um, and especially around like changes in the underlying yield strategies, right? Um, Okay, I wasn't paying super close attention earlier, but would the, this be the sort of thing where like Maker would ha have to approve any change in the underlying um, strategies, like if one were to be added or something like that, because uh, that would be a risk control that I'd personally be in favor of. So in, in this proposal, Maker governance is in control of those decisions. Yeah, so so the way that the vaults are set up is that there is a, a governance role. Um, this is used for you know production urine vaults. This is the urine multisig, and this is how strategies are added and removed from vaults. And so in Maker's case, uh, this would be you know whatever system Maker wanted in. So they would ultimately be the ones in charge of you know approving uh, or removing strategies that that you know we could obviously consult on. But about risk also, uh, I wanted to add something. So, uh, we, we do a, a anyway, really the, the, yeah, the oh, sorry, yeah, uh, Faku, go for it. And then uh, Kurt, if you if you want to share that comment after uh, Faku, that would yeah. be good. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting. I, I wanted to, to add, um, because I think it's a good point, uh, making a uh, maker uh, community aware of all the risks and the risk score you need, especially. So what uh, the Yarn team can do is sharing the, um, the due diligence. It's it's not like a legal due diligence or whatever. It's not our like mini, you can call it informally, like a mini audit or something like that, that we do to all the projects that we uh, use in our strategies. So we can share that as um, as more information for makers, uh, risk uh, core unit to be able to evaluate if they want to include or if they want to uh, suggest uh, to governance, including a certain strategy or not. Yep, that would be helpful. And I, I didn't have a bunch more to add. I was just saying that. You know, it's a sort of thing where Maker would just want to apply its usual risk controls of kind of allocating, um, you know, based on the, the estimated risk and, you know, making sure to be able to survive whatever the like expected loss would be, um, you know, kind of like we do with the existing D3Ms that, you know, that put money into, you know, uh, Aave and Compound, right, where we're thinking about like what's the maximum exposure we want there, you know, this would be, be a similar case. So, so I guess uh, the, the question is uh, what level of 
public uh, like information there are behind the risks of strategies in particular? Was that kind of the, the basis of the question, Faku? Me? Oh, no, no, I, di I didn't. No, 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 I didn't ask a question at all. I, I was actually, it was a statement. Like, Jern can, I, I'm part of the Jern team. Um, we can share the due diligence uh, that we do of each uh, protocol we use for, for strategies. Oh, it, I, mis was, I misunderstood. It, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. I had like a weird, uh, like a choppy connection or something. I, I see the question on the chat, the 80% profit share. I just want to make sure that that person understands that the yearn performance fee is 20% and maker keeps 80%. I just want to make sure that that's clear. And we, we're going to be working together and the yearn strategists are always going to be making new strategies looking for new strategies, maintaining new strategies uh, through all their alerting systems. Um, so that's the justification of that performance fee. Do we have any questions or comments in terms of like the allocations or strategies that are being used? You know, the answer that being like, one point of uh, potential collaboration for the proposal. Sorry, you were kind of hard to hear. Could you repeat that, please? I think he's going to type it. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to read it out after he types it. So was asking if we have any questions or comments for uh, asset allocation, like how much should we deploy through this and what should be like the diversification between this and other uh, P like USDC PSM deployments? I think that would be like a question to strategic finance because I know they do a lot of the asset liability management work and uh, and maybe a mix between strategic finance and the risk team because risk also has uh, some thoughts and stuff, but yeah. Yeah, that, that's my take also because um, especially for the capital allocation inside the vault, it's something we need to work together to establish makers uh, exact risk profile. So, so then we can we can work together to to suggest a capital allocation per strategy based on the risk uh, that each strategy has. And yeah, and about the amount we are, yeah, we are super open to it to to, to to any any amount like to start like to start the onboarding process. Like corn, like corn said, uh, it's much more important to to be like to have the onboarding done and then be ready for the for the next bull market than the specific amount uh, that you guys decide to, to start investing in this opportunity. Yes. Uh, I would say we are open to more than one bespoke vault. And um, Ultimately, in 2023, that is kind of the model that we're moving toward. Uh, that is a conversation for another day. That is new technology. That should not be part of this. But we are open to that, sure. Uh, and then there was another question from uh, Nadia from the growth team uh, about how you guys think this will affect die yields in DeFi, if at all. I, why could it affect uh, the die deals in DeFi? Because this is this is a proposal for USDC, right? For the USDC from the PSM. I suppose theoretically, it's possible that if people, you know, that if we had enough USDC deployed, it could decrease borrowing rates for USDC, and people would borrow USDC preferentially over die. 
Um, but at this point, borrowing rates are so low across DeFi that I don't I don't really see that it, it being a significant enough change that it would drive meaningful uh, differences in die yield. A question for Adrian coming in there about the classification as here of the medium liquidity. Yeah, it's a fair point. It's just, yeah, there was no rationale to putting it, there's no specific or scientific rationale to putting it in a medium liquidity beyond the fact that this uh, USDC would be invested in strategy. So it would require some unwinding. But yeah, I suppose somewhere between, I don't think it, so instant is like. The USDC in the PSM, right? Anything less than that is less liquid objectively. But agreed, as it's on chain, it's technically more liquid than um, than an off-chain strategy, for instance. Yeah, I, I guess I wanted to also bring up the question of uh, whether or not there is room for like a D3M type integration where uh, of the maker vault on Yearn is earning like a certain percentage. And if, you know, we start depositing more USDC, like that yield obviously will decrease a bit and, and dilute down. Uh, but if maker governance wanted to target like a, a specific yield, and if we can't even get that yield to just withdraw, um, yeah, is there is there a kind of room for implementing like a D3M like mechanism to facilitate that? So that that was what I mentioned earlier when I said you know the speed of implementation depends on how many automated controls we want to make on the maker side. You know, obviously something like that can can definitely be built. Um, it's just a matter of uh, what what are the you know requirements um, or parameters it needs to satisfy. Uh, and then from there, you can design it and scope it and such. Uh, yes, uh, on our side, it's 100% possible. Like the the um, deposit and withdrawal functions are permissionless. Uh, we, we can help and provide the data from, for, for APR, which is which is anyways public, uh, and the calculations can be made because each vault has something that it's called the price per share, uh, which is what shows the, um, the yields accrued. So, so all, like all the data is on chain and anyways, we can help providing the, the information needed to implement that, like a D3, D3M uh, mechanism, type of mechanism. All right, do you want to note the time here? We have about 10 minutes left in our scheduled call. Uh, so if you do have any questions or comments, uh, please do bring them up now so we can get them in the recording uh, before we head out. If anybody thinks of any other questions, we're always on Telegram and Discord, and we're going to be doing another Know Your MIP session next Wednesday with Maker, December 14th at 1700. So feel free to attend. Yeah, that'll be a great session to uh, follow up on. I don't see chat doing anything, so I don't know. What do you think, Peyton? Seems like we have covered a lot of ground for today, so I really appreciate everyone coming out. Uh, I believe we do have one more planned GNR uh, this year, next week. So we'll be around same time, same place. Look forward to catching you all then. And uh, in the meantime, keep the conversations going in the forum and on the Discord. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thank guys. And thanks for the facilitation. It's been great.